All right, welcome. Uh, this is the first supplemental lecture in our uh, series on thermal management and or in electronic and mechanical systems for EML 3005 uh, senior design. Today we are going to discuss the design of heat sinks for microprocessors. Uh, however, this is going to be a general enough analysis that we'll be able to apply this to any system where a forced flow uh, convection heat sink is utilized. Real quick, I'd like to bring your attention to the board. This analysis is going to follow that found in this book here by Lee, Thermal Design, Heat Sinks, Thermoelectrics, Heat Pipes, Compact Heat Exchangers, and Solar Cells. This book is available for free online from the UF library to any UF student. Uh, it's a great resource. I highly recommend it. And if you have any questions about what we do in this lecture today, I would refer you here. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the first question is, you know, how much heat do microprocessors generate? And the, the first thing we should do is just realize what exactly a microprocessor is. Essentially, it's a large array of transistor gates that are charging and discharging repeatedly at some clock rate, uh, some frequency. So these gates that are charging and discharging have some characteristic capacitance. And if we know that, then we can get an idea of what the uh, power discharge is. And that's going to be in the form of heat. So to get an approximate uh, answer to this, we can just say, OK, the power dissipation is equal to the capacitance times the voltage squared times the frequency at which it's charging and discharging. And then, of course, for the total heat dissipation, we need to multiply that by the number of gates. So if we know that characteristic capacitance, which in the case of microprocessors is on the order of femtofarads, which is you know times 10 to the negative 15, um, then we can get a good idea of what the heat dissipation is. Now, obviously, that seems very small. But when we're talking about clock rates in the order of gigahertz and tens of millions of gates on a single processor, we can see that we get you know, substantial uh, heat dissipation. And in this case, um, our analysis shows roughly 140 watts of heat. And that's enough to cause damage to the system and its surrounding parts. Now, if you're designing a computer and you know exactly how much processing power you need, then you can go to the spec sheet for that microprocessor. In this case, we're looking at a 2.8 gigahertz Pentium 4. And we can see that the thermal design power, which is the thermal load that's generated for that particular uh, microprocessor is 89 watts. And this spec sheet will also tell you what the optimum operating temperature is in that case. And in this case, it's 69 degrees C. So, oh, and the difference that we're seeing from 89 to roughly 140 is because we don't have uniform clocking of all those gates. That 140 that we came up with was like the upper bound. Uh, anyway, so these are the two design points we need. We need to be able to dissipate 89 watts, and we need to be able to keep the processor at 69 degrees C. So that's what we're going to figure out how to do today. All right. So uh, there are a couple primary types of heat sinks. The first is a passive type in which you have very large fins and you use natural convection and radiation to get rid of the excess heat. There's also dynamic or forced convection types where you have a coupled system of uh, heat, sink, heat sink fins and a fan. And that fan forces air over the fins to take away all that heat that is being convected or conducted into them from the microprocessor. And that's what we're going to focus on because that's what's most prevalent in most uh, personal computing applications. So we're going to look at a somewhat idealized system uh, of a linear array of stationary straight fins. And we're going to consider the whole system at a uniform temperature T0. So that means that the, ins or the 
heat sink is a perfect conductor. Now its dimensions, you can see the width here is W, the length of those channels is L, the height of the channels is given as B, the thickness of the channels is given, or the thickness rather of the fins is T, and Z here is the th width of the channels through which we're going to have our flow. Now, this lecture is going to focus on finding an optimum value for Z. That's what we're going to focus on today. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about optimizing the rest of the system. But what we're going to find is that that fin spacing is extremely important for, um, it's probably the most important variable in the geometry of our heat sink. So let's talk about why. We're going to look at the two extreme cases of fin spacing. The first is one in which the channels are very narrow. And that's shown here in case one. If we have a, for a given length of channel, a given L, uh, if the channels are very, very narrow, then we can see that the entry length is going to be very small and the flow, both the velocity profile and the thermal uh, profile is going to be very, uh, it's going to be fully developed and it's going to be, it's going to develop very, very quickly. What that means is that the temperature of the flow, the incoming temperature is T infinity, but if the thermal profile uh, develops very, very quickly, then the flow inside is going to reach the wall temperature very quickly before it exits. And if that's the case, then obviously if you're wall is at T naught and your fluid's at T naught, no heat transfer is going on. So that means that the channel is too long. However, we're going to also look at the other case, case two, uh, where the channels are so widely spaced that we have isolated thermal and velocity boundary layers on either side of the channel. This is bad because we see that there is this region, this core region right here, where flow is entering at T infinity and leaving at T infinity. So there's, you know, it's not doing any cooling whatsoever. So we can see that we don't want it to be too close. We don't want it to be too far away. So we need to find a happy medium in there where we're going to get an optimum amount of heat transfer for a given spacing. And so that's what we're going to focus on finding today. And to do that, we are going to set the length and we're going to find the heat transfer for these two extreme cases. We're going to set them equal to one another and find where they match up. OK, so we're going to consider first case one, which is the narrow channel case. We're going to assume steady state. Uh, fully developed, incompressible, and laminar flow. We're going to realize that there's a no-slip boundary condition at the uh, channel walls. And we're going to say that there's a constant pressure gradient along the channel length. And this is going to be the case because we're going to have one end open to ambient, the other end is being fed from a fan. We, what we're going to want is we're going to want the mass flow rate of air. And we're going to relate that to the amount of heat transfer via our m dot c sub p delta t uh, relations. So the so first thing we need is the mass flow rate. So we're going to realize that this is Poisson flow. And that is going to mean that we have a velocity profile as such, uh, where our velocity is a function of our pressure gradient and the viscosity of the fluid and the channel spacing. Then we can find the average velocity by integrating this over the area and dividing by the area to get u bar, which is going to be equal to z squared over 12 mu times delta p over l. If, none of the, if this doesn't look familiar, I recommend just going back and reviewing your fluids one notes. But uh, you know this should look pretty uh, familiar to you. It's pretty straightforward analysis. Then 
If we know u bar, we can find the mass flow rate by multiplying it by the density of the fluid and the area over which it is um, traveling. And also we're going to multiply it by n, which is our number of channels so that we get the total mass flow rate. So great, that's what we needed. Now there's a couple other quantities we want to talk about that are just geometric in nature. Um, first off, the cross-sectional area, I'm just going to call that AC. Now that is just equal, if you look at the uh, figure above here, that's just equal to B times Z. And you can see that right here. That's just the area through one channel in which a, uh, the flow is traveling. Also, the number of fins, n, we're going to relate that to the geometric dimensions of our heat sink. And we're going to do that by recognizing that n is going to be equal to w, our total width, divided by t plus z, where t is the thickness and z is the spacing of the fins. Now if we do that, we're going to be making sub these substitutions into later equations. So just keep these geometric relations in mind. Okay, so, oh, first thing we want to do is we want to know what the total flow area is. So the total flow area obviously is just the channel area times, so I'll call this A, F, T, and that's just equal to the channel area times the number of channels, right? A, C times N. And so using the relations we just discussed on the previous slide, this is equal to W B Z over Z plus T. Great. Now the total surface area, and this is the area through which we're going to be convecting the heat away to the free stream. So that's going to be A S total. So we're only going to consider the area that is the large faces of the fins. So these faces, we're not going to consider heat transfer from the landings or the edges of the fins. So you can see that the dimensions of that is equal to B, L, then their N uh, fins. But also we need to remember that we're convecting heat from both faces of the fins, so we're going to multiply that by 2. And then making the substitutions, we get 2WBL over Z plus T. Okay, and we're going to be using these going forward as well. Now our rate of heat transfer like I said, it's just going to be our standard uh, heat capacity times temperature difference equation. So rate of heat transfer, Q dot, is going to equal to our mass flow rate times the heat capacity of our working fluid times our delta T, which we're going to assume that when it leaves the system, it's at the temperature of the wall. So that's just going to be T naught minus T infinity. Now, if we use the equation that uh, we developed earlier for the mass flow rate, we can get the uh, new equation for Q dot, and it's equal to rho times z cubed b over 12 mu delta P over L, W over Z plus T. Again, this W plus Z plus over Z plus T is equal to our number of channels. 
times C sub P delta T. All right, and this is the heat transfer equation we're going to use for the uh, narrow channel case. All right, so now we'll consider the second case where we have isolated boundary layers on either side of the channel due to wide spacing. The first thing we're going to recognize is that the uh, heat transfer is going to be given by Newton's law of cooling. And Newton's law of cooling just says that the heat transfer is proportional to the area through which you're convecting heat times the temperature difference between the wall and the working fluid. And that proportionality is equal to some heat transfer coefficient, which we're going to call h bar. So that just means we have q equals um, the surface area times some heat transfer coefficient times the change in temperature, which is T naught minus T infinity. Okay, so we need to now have a way of determining what H bar is. And to do that, we're going to use the prenel blasius nusselt number correlation. Uh, this equation is in the textbook I had discussed earlier by Lee. And what it does is it gives you a, a correlation that goes between the heat transfer coefficient, the length of the tube, and the Reynolds number of the flow. So using that, we come up with a very you know, straightforward equation here where H bar is equal to K over L, just using a little algebra, 0 0.664 square root of Reynolds number, cube root of Prandtl number. And we're going to plug this in into our Newton's law of cooling to get the heat transfer. However, uh, I want you to notice that if we plug this correlation in, what we'll have is heat transfer as a function of u infinity because the flow rate is in the Reynolds number. And really what we want is we want it in terms of delta p. So we need to make a uh, substitution there. And to do that, we're going to make a shear stress balance across the channel. Now, the thing to remember here is that so the shear stress, the average shear stress, that we experience through the channel, so average shear stress times the area over which it's acting, the surface area of the fins, should be balanced by the delta P generated by the fan over the area of the flow. Okay? So what that'll do is give us a, a relation between delta P and tau like so. Tau should equal to delta P times, leave it Z over 2L. And that's just a little algebra, making the substitutions that we discussed earlier. Now, again, we're going to invoke a prandtl blasius laminar correlation, uh, just like the one we used for the heat transfer coefficient. And here we see that we get a, mm, these are not dots, they are bars. We get a correlation between tau bar, our shear stress, average shear stress, to the Reynolds number, which is a function of u infinity. So now we have tau as a function of delta p and tau as a function of u infinity. So we can bring those together and come up with a correlation between u infinity and delta p. And once we do that, we get this expression here, which gives us u infinity in terms of delta p and the geometry of the channel, z and l, as well as the, fluid proper, the viscous fluid properties of the working fluid. Down here, I've also included a couple useful definitions that we're going to use to help simplify our 
final expression, uh, just remember that we have alpha as the thermal diffusivity, um, mu as the kinematic viscosity, and the Reynolds number and Parnell number. Okay, so now, in order to find that optimum thin spacing, again, we're going to set those two heat transfer values that we discussed for case one and case two equal to one another, and we're going to isolate z and solve for it. So here's the final expression, or well, here's the expression of the two. On the, the left here, we have the m dot that we developed, mass flow rate of air, times c sub p delta t for case one. And then for case two, where we have the isolated boundary layers, we have the total surface area times h bar, heat transfer coefficient that we developed from those correlations, times delta t. Great. Now we're going to do some simplification and isolate z on one side. And we come up with this expression. And we see that everything cancels out except for the length of the channel, a couple fluid properties here, the viscosity, dynamic viscosity, and the thermal diffusivity, and the pressure change. So this is a really powerful equation that we're going to use in our heat sink design. So once again, here's our optimum Z equation. And we want to plug this into one of our heat transfer equations. Doesn't matter which one, you'd get the same thing. So right now we're just going to plug it into the case one, where we have the Q dot equals M dot C sub P delta T. And remember that when we plug uh, Z optimum into this equation, what we're going to get is we're going to get the optimum Q value, or the maximum heat transfer value. So we do that, and we get the maximum heat transfer is equal to this function here that's a function of the width, the total width of the heat exchanger, the fin height, the fin height, and the delta P, and then various fluid properties. So this is a very this is the equation we're going to use in our analysis. So let's go ahead and do a quick example. We're going to you know, recall the Pentium 4 example we talked about earlier. Uh, 2.8 gigahertz processor. We want to keep it at 69 degrees C while dissipating 89 watts. And we don't want the device to exceed a cubic volume of 5 centimeters to a side. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and say, OK, well, we know what our, the, heat, the amount of heat we want to dissipate is 89 watts. We know our temperature of our free stream and of our fin, or all of our fins, rather. Uh, we know the fluid properties, density, C sub P, Reynolds, or Prandtl number, rather. And we're going to go ahead and assume that we're using all of the basal area that we have. So L and W are both going to be 5 centimeters for this. Now we're also, we need to choose a fan. And I'm just going to use a standard 120 millimeter computer fan that you can get on Newegg for 250. And what I want to do is I want to use that fan at its optimum efficiency point so that we're minimizing parasitics. So I'm going to plot the efficiency curve of that fan. And it's shown here in blue. In blue, we have the efficiency of the fan versus the pressure differential generated. And we can see that it, at its maximum, the maximum efficiency occurs at about 100 pascals. So that's great. We know our delta P. and because we know our delta P, we can calculate our Z optimum. We know our delta P and our L, so we can calculate our Z optimum, which turns out to be uh, 4.6 millimeters. So it's pretty narrow spacing. And again, if we go back a couple slides, we can see here that if we know our delta P, which we do because we're using the maximum efficiency point at 100 pascals, we know our temperature change, we know our C sub P, 
we're assuming our w and we know our Prandtl number and we know what we're dissipating. We're dissipating 89 watts. So the only thing that's unknown is b. So now we can plug in all those known values and we see that our b is equal to 5 millimeters. And that's plotted right here in red. And that's it. It's a pretty straightforward analysis. And you know, you have the beginnings of your heat sink. So that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to look at a less idealized case where we have temperature gradients inside the fins. And we're going to see how that affects this analysis. And we're going to look at how to find the optimum thickness of those fins, as well as the number of fins and optimum materials. Thank you.